In the headlines, North Korea holds a rare open meeting at the UN headquarters and says it's on the right path in terms of its human rights record, although there might have been occasional hiccups. The Korean government decides to inject an additional 5 trillion won into the Korean economy, still grappling with the dull domestic demand and the weak yen hurting its exporters. And a 6.6 magnitude earthquake hits southwest China's Winnan province, killing at least one person and injuring dozens of others. Welcome to the program. You're watching Primetime News coming to you live from Seoul. I am Kang Tae-ri. And I'm Sean Lim. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. We begin with North Korea's public acknowledgement of its labor camps in front of the United Nations. Pyongyang defended its human rights record and denied that the camps were used for political purposes. Mm, holding a rare session on this matter, the North Korea mission at the UN says the gulags actually help people mentally. Our Choi Yoo-sun has our top story. North Korea has publicly admitted the existence of its labor camps for the first time as the international community increases pressure on the North to stop abusing the human rights of its people. At a rare session on the issue Tuesday, the North Korean delegation at the UN said the so-called reform through labor detention camps helps people adjust through their mentality and reflect on their wrongdoings. The North Koreans, however, deny that they run political prison camps. Pyongyang also said it is open to discussing its human rights record so long as there is sincerity behind the talks. It revealed a North Korean official recently met with a European Union human rights official and that the two sides will meet soon. As the UN plans to adopt a resolution next month condemning human rights abuses in the North, Pyongyang accused Washington of trying to topple the North Korean leadership. And DPRK is totally against misusing human rights for regime change in the country. And in particular, as I said, for United States, who is not recognizing DPRK as a sovereign state. The North's UN delegation denounced the international community's push for a resolution, saying it would cause a further strain on inter-Korean relations. And we do oppose uh, these resolutions. Uh, this resolution means confrontation, and confrontation is not compatible with the dialogue and, uh, and cooperation that we are very much in favor of. Defending itself, North Korea shoveled the blame towards South Korean military exercises and international economic sanctions, which it says are acting as obstacles to improving human rights in the North. Choi Yoo-sun, Arirang News. A former U.S. defense chief says that the United States and South Korea will consider using nuclear weapons should Pyongyang attack Seoul. And he also admits that Washington does not know much about uh, the inner workings of the North Korean regime. Kim Yeonbin has the details. In his recently published memoir entitled Worthy Fights, former U.S. Defense Secretary Leon Panetta speaks about the threat of war on the Korean Peninsula. Should worse come to worst, Panetta says the option of using nuclear weapons on North Korea was available to Washington, Seoul, and U.S. forces Korea. In terms of a missile attack on the U.S. mainland, Panetta said North Korea is considered the biggest threat, bigger than China or even Russia. He described the regime as the most troublesome in the world, and that the U.S. government spends a considerable amount of time and money trying to predict what they would do next. He also acknowledged that despite those efforts, U.S. intelligence on the inner workings of the regime is weak and barely scratches the surface. For example, Panetta points out that Washington was in the dark on North Korea's succession plans in 2009 and was surprised when Kim Jong-un emerged the strongest contender to assume power from his father, Kim Jong-il. Overall, Panetta says U.S. intelligence on the inner workings of the regime has been lacking for years. Kim Hyun-bin. Arirang News. 
A former chief of U.S. forces Korea says Washington should not publicly press Seoul to accept the deployment of the so-called THAAD missile defense system. At a forum in Washington Tuesday, Burwell Bell, who served as a USFK commander from 2006 to 2008, said although he agrees with Washington's plan, um, it would simply be irresponsible for the current administration to press South Korea either diplomatically or publicly. He stressed that the issue should be settled with the South Korean government first before being made public. His comments come after a U.S. military official openly said discussions were being held on a possible thought deployment. This while Seoul was still denying the possibility. With President Park Geun-hye pushing through with her vision to reunite the two Koreas, the South Korean government is carefully giving itself a head start. Analysis by Seoul's financial regulator shows 500 billion U.S. dollars is needed to bridge the economic gap between Seoul and Pyongyang. Ji Myung Gil has the details. The South Korean government, in a plan that will be formally announced later this month, will seek financial assistance from the OECD, look to maximize the use of North Korean resources, and foster the private investment of South Korean firms in North Korea. This in attempts to ease the burden on North Korea's economy in preparation for unification of the two Koreas. The South Financial Services Commission says the only feasible way to minimize unification costs is to develop North Korea's economy. North Korea's per capita gross national income is presumed to be around 1,200 U.S. dollars, 18 times smaller than South Korea's. Raising the North's figure to $10,000 within 20 years would come at an estimated expense of $500 billion. It's money that would go toward rebuilding North Korea's social infrastructure and developing industrial complexes. The South Korean government is considering ways to restructure Pyongyang's exchange rate system, reorganize its financial infrastructure, and set up new policies in the banking sector. The financial regulator says unification with North Korea would open up new opportunities for South Korea, as it will create larger market demand and alleviate the geopolitical risk factors on the Korean peninsula. Kim young Arirang News. President Park Geun-hye will attend the 10th summit of the Asia-Europe meeting, better known as ASEM, in Milan, Italy next week. In line with the summit's theme of responsible partnership for sustainable growth and security, President Park will talk about her vision of connectivity between Asia and Europe. The president will also travel to Rome next Friday to seek stronger cooperation in her envisioned creative economy, trade and energy plans. Ahead of the official visit to Rome, she will pay a courtesy call to Pope Francis at the Vatican. Your gateway to the day's biggest stories in Korea and around the world. Breaking news, the hottest interviews, and a whole lot more. Join Arirang Sean Lim and Kang Chae Ri from the heart of Seoul. News begins now. Primetime news, weeknights, live at 10 on Arirang TV. To boost the recovery momentum for the Korean economy, the Korean government says it's injecting additional stimulus measures to help Korea's smaller firms. Kim ji tells us more. The Korean government will pump an additional 4.7 billion U.S. dollars on top of the 24 billion dollars worth of policy funds it plans to spend this year to boost economic growth. Under the plan, around 3.3 billion dollars will be spent on the provision of financial loans to encourage small and mid-sized companies to import more. 650 million dollars will be spent solely on boosting facilities investment. The remainder, 370 million dollars will be used to support the Export-Import Bank of Korea to promote the country's exports. A separate amount of more than $930 million will go toward increasing financial support to Korean exporters to Japan, particularly small and mid-sized companies, to help them ride the wave of the weakening Japanese currency. 
The government says it will also increase the number of duty-free shops to meet rising demand from Chinese tourists visiting Korea. If the plan succeeds, the government says it expects the economy to grow by a maximum of an extra 0.2 percentage point in the fourth quarter and reach its yearly target of 3.7 percent. An analyst from Kyobo Securities Company sees the government's plan as a positive step towards steering the economy in the right direction. The effectiveness of the measures can be gauged by how business entities react. Will they expand their investments despite the external risks? Samsung Electronics' decision earlier this week to build a semiconductor plant in Pyeongtaek could be seen as a positive. The additional measures come amid mixed signals about how stable Korea's economic recovery actually is. Business sentiment among Korean companies edged up in September from the previous month, but the latest industrial output dropped by 0.6 percent in August from the previous month. Kim Jeon, Arirang News. Korea's retail and tourism industries are all smiles after a record number of Chinese tourists came to the country for their Chinese National Day holiday, which just came to an end on Tuesday. But will the good times keep on coming? Our Connie Kim reports. A record 160,000 Chinese tourists are estimated to have flooded into Korea during their national holiday, but many of them have expressed frustration about their experiences here. Reflecting their dissatisfaction, less than 30 percent of Chinese tourists have made a second visit to Korea in the past three years. Identifying the problems is a first step. For one, Chinese tourists spent more than half of their money on shopping during their stay in Korea which experts say poses issues over the long term. The product brands these tourists buy are mostly global ones that can be bought in other countries as well. If Korea starts losing price competitiveness, it won't be as appealing for the Chinese to visit Korea. Peck says demand among Chinese travelers for leisure activities will rise as their income levels do. For that reason, it's recommended that Korea begin investing more time and energy into culture, leisure and entertainment travel packages that are unique to Korea. I wish there were more chances to experience Korean culture such as trying on the traditional costume hanbok and more tours outside of Seoul. I personally want to go down to Chuncheon to taste their trademark chicken dish dakgalbi. I want to visit Busan and also try making chicken ginseng soup and kimchi while I'm here. The availability of affordable accommodations is another hurdle for Korea's tourism market. There are some 190 tourist hotels currently in Seoul, but less than one-fifth are two- to three-star hotels. Now that keeps many Chinese tourists from booking return flights to Korea. And government regulations are holding back new construction projects. Hotels are currently banned from being within 200 meters of a school. But because of the growing demand for accommodations, this regulation is expected to be eased in the long term. The shopping may be luring Chinese tourists here now, but Korea will need to show it has more to offer to keep the millions of Chinese visitors coming year after year. Connie Kim, Arirang News. A large number of Korean smartphone users are turning their backs on the country's number one messaging application and taking their business elsewhere due to privacy concerns. The exodus began after local prosecutors said they would begin investigating online rumors, which are false, that prompted fears that the government could read users' messages. German-based Telegram Messenger says one and a half million Koreans have subscribed to their service over the past week. Telegram, which said it would launch a Korean version of its service soon, is popular across the world because it is heavily encrypted. Kakao Talk said Wednesday that it plans to adopt a privacy mode that will have similar features. Two Americans and a German have won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry this year for their achievements in realizing super-resolved fluorescence microscopy. Sweden's Nobel Prize Foundation announced that the prize and $1.1 million will jointly be awarded to Eric Betzig of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Stanford University's William Morner and Stefan Hell 
a director at the Max Planck Institute in Germany. The Nobel Committee explained their groundbreaking work has helped bypass the limit of maximum resolution in traditional optical microscopy. If you're an avid fan of Korea's ancient palaces, you will know that a part of Toksugung Palace in Seoul had been off limits for the past few years. But this uh, building, uh, called Sokjujan, and, and, will, and visitors will now be able to take a tour of this building starting next week. Here is our Pak Juan with more. Completed in 1910, Sokjojan is a Western-style stone building, part of Toksugung Palace in central Seoul. Designed by British architect G. R. Harding, the three-story hall was built according to the 18th-century European court style, and it housed King Gojong's sleeping quarters and audience rooms. The building went through so many alterations during more than 35 years of Japanese occupation in the early 20th century and following the Korean War. And Sokjoja now opens to the public after five years of restoration work, which cost some 13 million U.S. dollars. We have put items that have been stored at the National Palace Museum of Korea, but in their original position. After thoroughly studying old pictures and doing our own research, Sokjojeon will open to the public from next Monday. Visitors can see over 130 displayed items inside the building, including about 40 pieces of original furniture set up at the time of the building's establishment. Visitors can also watch documentaries about Korea's modern history and King Gojong and his royal families. King Gojong was the final king of Joseon dynasty that lasted some 600 years and the first emperor of the short-lived Great Korean Empire, which was forcefully annexed by Japan. Historians have shown us that Seok Jojeon is not a symbol of foreign annexation, but a symbol of King Gojong's willingness for independent modernization. So this hall is of great historic importance to Korea. Seokjojeon, a grand building that has bore witness to some of the most vivid parts of Korea's modern history, is finally back with the Korean people some 104 years after its establishment. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. A massive 6.6 .6 magnitude earthquake rocked China's Wenan province last night as rescue operations continue to search for survivors. With more, we turn to Paul Yi at the News Center. Paul, this is the second powerful earthquake to strike this region in fewer than two months. How is the government coping with this natural disaster? Well, Beijing has deployed thousands of troops to assist re relief efforts in the southwestern province. Chinese state media says more than 124,000 people have been displaced in the wake of widespread destruction and possible aftershocks. This as local authorities confirmed on Monday that at least one person has died, while injuries are numbering in the hundreds. Our Quan Zua has a story. Buildings shook, electricity and telephone services went out, roofs crumbled, and people ran out of their homes. When a powerful earthquake that the China Earthquake Network Center has measured at 6.6 .6 in magnitude rattled Qinggu County in China's southwestern Yunnan province late Tuesday night. Officially, at least one person has been killed and more than 320 injured. Some local media reports say five people have lost their lives. The epicenter was located 85 kilometers from Pu'er City, an underdeveloped yet densely populated area made up of various ethnic minorities. The tremors were also felt in Yunnan province's capital of Kunming and other neighboring cities. Chinese geological officials say the quake was just five kilometers deep, another factor that could worsen damage. Chinese Prime Minister Li Keqiang has ordered immediate rescue operations. Around 1,000 emergency officials are on site to attend to those in need. Some have said that the damage is not as bad as the magnitude 6.3 quake that struck the same region two months ago, killing more than 600 people. Kwon Arirang News. 
And staying in Asia, pro-democracy activists have struck a deal with leading Hong Kong officials to hold formal talks this Friday. But demonstrators have expressed concern over the limited scope of the proposed dialogue as it will fall within the framework of Hong Kong's constitution. Local authorities say the demands for universal suffrage in 2017 votes run squarely against those rules. Despite dwindling numbers, student leaders have called on protesters to continue the fight until a breakthrough is made. If Ms. Carrie Lam or other Hong Kong officials still insist that they will not respond or they will not try um, to solve the political problem, we, um, we may consider to end the political dialogue. The prolonged movement, meanwhile, has been hitting the economy, raising backlash from local businesses. The Hong Kong Retail Management Association says companies in Hong Kong saw their sales dip as much as 80 percent during the Golden Week holiday. And finally, the social networking service Twitter is suing the U.S. government as it continues its fight against federal authorities to protect user data. The microblogging firm filed a lawsuit on Tuesday in California, claiming that its free speech rights are being violated, more specifically the restrictions on how much information it can disclose regarding government surveillance requests. The Justice Department responded to the lawsuit, saying it has addressed similar concerns from others in the IT industry. Five major tech companies, including Google and Microsoft, reached a settlement with the government earlier this year, but Twitter rejected the deal, saying it should not be bound by any disclosure limits at home or abroad. And that wraps up our look at international stories making headlines around the world. I'll see you back here on Friday. Hello and welcome. I'm Stephen Che with your look at sports tonight. Let's kick things off on the pitch as South Korea men's national football team gears up for their friendly match against Paraguay Friday. Uli Stilica also makes his head coaching debut. The 59-year-old German manager has promised a revamped team. From formations and tactics to the lineup itself, Stilica will stir the pot until his standards are met. Now he's laid out his options, saying that he would use all 23 players and employ various tactics in the upcoming international exhibitions, starting with Paraguay. And speaking of the South American side, they're unbeaten in, the, in their three previous matches, so we can expect a battle. Now kickoff is at 8 p.m. sharp on Friday in Chonan. And moving on to baseball, it's the meeting of the KBO Titans. The Samsung Lions went up against the Nexon Heroes. Samsung's Rick Vandenherk faces Nexon's Andy Van Hecken for the Aces duel. And such, it's a scoreless three-hit ball game until the bottom of the sixth. Nexon breaks the tie on Yuhan Jun's RBI double. It's 1-0. Nexon pulls Van Hecken, who threw a gem, a seven-strikeout three-hitter in six and a third innings. Now in the seventh, Pak Kondo doubles the lead, and it all stays that way until the top of the ninth. Yamaiko Navarro ties it all up with a two-run single, taking away Van Hecken's 20th win of the season. Right now, it's tied 3-3 three three in the bottom of the tenth, with Nexon up at bat. And looking at the other matchup, Tuzan beats Kia 4-2. And more baseball, but this time over to the MLB playoffs. The St. Louis Cardinals and San Francisco Giants won their games to advance to the NL Championship Series. The Cards edged out the Dodgers as the usually sharp Clayton Kershaw gave up the winning three-run home run in the seventh inning. Meanwhile, the Giants run on a wild pitch by the Nationals pitcher in the seventh inning gave the Giants the 3-2 victory. Now, St. Louis and San Francisco will meet in the NLCS. They last met there in 2012 when the Giants ended up winning the World Series. Meanwhile, it's another swimmer in deep waters. An 18-month suspension has been handed down to a Japanese swimmer who stole a journalist's camera during the Asian Games. Breaststroke specialist Naoya Tomita was given the sentence by Japan Swimming Federation, which said he'll be banned until March 31st of 2016. 
Now, Tomita was caught in the act by security cameras and expelled by Team Japan during the Asiad on September 27th. The 25-year-old was given a summary indictment and a fine by prosecutors before returning to Japan. And that wraps it up for now. Stay tuned for your weather update. Good night. Hello everyone, I'm Kim Bo Kyung with your weather updates. Now today is Hallo, one of the 24 seasonal indicators that marks the beginning of chilly days ahead. The morning low here in Seoul dropped to 11 degrees but quickly rose to the mid-20s. Keep in mind that the big gap in temperatures from day to night will continue. Otherwise, perfect fall weather awaits us as we head into the 100-day holiday. Light showers are forecast for parts of the eastern coast, but overall weather should be nice and sunny and looking ahead, rainy conditions may start off our week next Monday. On to Thursday's readings. Sunny Seoul hits 25, Daegu in Gwangju 26. On to other regions, Daejeon reaches 24, Jeju 23. That's all the updates for now. Tune in for more after midnight. See you soon. That was the lunar eclipse, so sorry, sorry to have missed it, but if mm. you want to see a moonless sky, just turn in the other direction on another night. That's what you're going to say yeah. on our closing. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that happens every <laughs> night, not so special. And that's uh, primetime news on this Wednesday, and tomorrow we'll be off for Hangul Day. And I'm Kang Chiri. And I'm Sean Lim. Thanks for watching. We'll see you soon.